All right, welcome to Word in Your Attic, Thomas Walsh. Hello, Thomas. Where do we find you? Uh, in lockdown, which is a place just outside Dublin. <laughs> uh, I'm in a place called RD, which is A-R-D-A-A. It's in County Loud. You appear to be wearing some uh, psychedelic welding goggles. Well, talk us through those. Well, I, I, that's what I've been doing mainly during lockdown is welding. Uh, <clears throat> I've welded all the all the albums I don't really like together into one giant album. <laughs> and then I'm going to actually make a record player the size of the entire thing I make. So it's going to be about 50 foot long, the record player, and it'll just play continuous Ed Stupa albums. Actually, <laughs> now, we might as well start on something quite exciting, right? All right, go on, what's this? Stupor. Oh, Ed Stupor. Oh, excellent work. work. Good right, grief. The, 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 the thing is, uh, there's a reason why I have Ed Stupor's pop party. Uh, because on the back, some of his songs for the party, for the kids, right? The kids? I'll try right. that bit yeah. on it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He does tie a yellow ribbon, you know, all the beautiful stuff Simon says, the children are singing now. Uh, the wombling dance, all fantastic. And then all of a sudden, you have a um, game, and it's called Musical Statues. And the song that he has to accompany it is Night of Fear by the Move. <laughs> so uh, I'm not quite sure what kind of a party that was. No, um, uh, and then we have a, like, a, a dance section with uh, three songs of T-Rex. Which is fair enough, but you know, for the kids, I was thinking Night of Fear. Yeah, it seems slightly odd. Seems <laughs> so. Uh, he also covered an Idol Ray song in 1968, which I have. So uh, you're a kind of you're a kind of Idol Race, uh, Jeff Lynne, Roy Wood move completist, aren't you? Let's be fair about this. You you've got everything, haven't you? Is that fair to say? There's people out there who have incredible collections, but I have a very special collection, uh, which I'll I'll show you bits of as we go along. Is that the way? Go it on. Yeah, go on, Dave, do yeah, it. We're, go we're on, in absolutely. your hands. Well, I'll jump in. By the way, this is my 1967 box. All right, okay. Oh, fabulous. Oh, lovely. So I have special records in this one, but last night I went through the whole, the whole collection just to kind of find special ones for me. And this is the birthday party, original. I think it's original oh. stereo. Oh, wow. That's the Idol Race. Yeah, the first album, but it's signed by... Jeff, when I was with the lads in 2014, Jeff Lynn's Walk of Fame Award, uh, he invited me over to Birmingham. So that's all the lads. And Roger Spencer writes to Thomas, the fifth member of the Oil Race. Ah, oh, very good. Fantastic. Very good. So, so that came out, what, 1967? Is that what you said? 67? Right, okay. No, it's a 67 box, as in it was made in 1967, that box. Right, right, right. Uh, no, I meant, I meant the album. 68. Right, 68. And that was on United Artists, wasn't it? Something like that? Liberty United Artists? I think it was. Yes, it was on Liberty in the UK. Uh, lots of, di well, Liberty associate labels in America, you know. Right, 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 uh, right. And what was the attraction of the, the, the Idol Race and the move in all those bands? Because you were, I can't imagine how young you must have been with all those, I mean, some of those, you obviously weren't born when some of those records were coming out, but in the mid-70s, what, well, what was it about that that appealed to you? Well, there was a, there was a, a definite love in my family for Wizard. Uh, my brothers had this kind of, you know, when he was on top of the pops, they went for him. And, you know, so as much as we love, obviously love Bowie and Mark Bowling and the Sweet and all that, Slade, of course, incredible. The Slade were loved. Slade in Ireland are like the royalty. <laughs> you know, incredible. Slade. And of course, Gilbert O'Sullivan was our god. And, uh, you know, so we had all these, because we, we got British TV, obviously, in Dublin. And so we lived the British life TV-wise all those years. So I was born in 69. I started remembering from 74, uh -huh. pretty much. So I remember Rock and Roll Winter on Top of the Pops, where he's playing a Hoover. <laughs> and uh, I also remember on that episode, there was a... Oh, God, it'll come back to me, but there was some incredible... Uh, I'm a walking miracle. Ooh, that song. Uh, okay. Whoever that was, I can't remember the names. I can't remember who it was. No. 
And uh, so there's all, so we had a tape from the TV and stuff. So we had this love of of Roy Wood and then of course loads of other bands. But then ELO was the connection because my brother started buying the ELO records. And then the connection I made to Roy Wood by buying Miles' compilations like Light Shines On and, you know, that came out in the late 70s on Harvest, which are great compilations. Great right. sounding, Great looking. So, you know, a lot of passion then at eight, nine years old for this music. Now, one day I was playing the Battle of Marston Moor, which is on the fourth CLO album, which is basically Roy Wood throwing cellos at the wall. And, you know, barely his French horns going, Bloo! and Roy Wood talking like he's in the court of King Arthur. And my dad came in, he went, I don't know how we can, we can speak on this, but I'll be honest with you. Just came into the parlor where I was lying on the couch, I was about 10, and he went, what the fucking hell is that? <laughs> That's all he said. All fathers have done it at some stage. <laughs> <laughs> I'll never forget it. Uh, because honestly, when he came in, it was in the middle bit where I swear to God, he's sawing the cello in half. <laughs> but I was listening to anything. I wanted everything. So, of course, I went to the mill. But we might as well get it on film if you want about your part in my, my downfall. Go on. <laughs> Which was, uh, all very whistled as the course was essential. Right. Uh, and of course, when you took it over in the late 70s and early 80s and stuff, um, it was essential viewing, but my mother was still dragging me to bingo. <laughs> so I was at around 10, 11 years old. I mean, mom was still going, you're coming to bingo with me. And I said, man, I don't want lung cancer at 55. <laughs> uh, because you couldn't see anything in these Dublin bingo houses. <laughs> so, so you get warm Coca-Cola and chocolate, which, which is why I am the way I am now. And, <laughs> and you just run around while my mom is there going like that, smoking. So one night, whistle test was on, I think about half... Maybe half nine or something. It was on at a weird time around eighty one. Do you remember this? It was probably well. They always shuffled it around. It was always on at inconvenient times. But go on, carry on. So anyway, um, I was coming up the road with my mum. I think she'd even gone into the chipper on the way home to buy some <gasps> chips because she might have won a lion. <coughs> I think she might have got five quid on a lion or something. And uh, my brother's at the door and he's going, Thomas. Quick, the mover on television. Of course, I think I knocked my mother over running up the road. And I, I literally just piled in. And all I remember is seeing Jeff Lynn's hat and the curly hair and it fading. And then your face, David Hepworth, oh, really? oh, God. coming on screen going, oh, you know, that's a clip. Whistle That's test. enough of that. That's enough of that. <laughs> Here's two more from Robert Palmer. That's right. <laughs> and a clip of Stackridge in 1972. <laughs> Kiss in the pink. Oh, uh, I've got the man in the baller hat here somewhere. Anyway, um, oh, so, uh, <laughs> so I, I, what I did was I went to the paper. I was going nuts. And I went to the local paper, the Evening Herald, very famous Dublin paper. And I had, it was written in the little whistle test section, uh, vintage clip, uh, vintage move. OGWT clip, the move. And I used to check the, the listings and all, but I missed it. So I, I brought the paper upstairs and I cried, <laughs> literally cried myself to sleep <laughs> for missing it. I, I, I swear to God, I'm not even telling a word of a lie, lads. I cried for about two days. So, fast forward. <laughs> Sorry, I know I'm talking. Okay. Fast forward a few years to when you did the rock and roll jukebox. The 12 hour, 14 hour. Uh, oh, rock, rock around, rock around, the, around clock. the clock. Yeah, around the 24 the hour choose your own video. The, the video yeah. vote. Yeah, go That's on, right. carry on. Yeah. And XTC were on the end of that. They never got voted. We never saw a grass video. I was desperately <laughs> waiting for that as well. But um, anyway, uh, you said you were going to show old clips and you waited till about 10 to 5 in the morning 
to show, to show the old whistle test clips. And I had a video recorder at the time, the, the house video recorder with the, with the remote control with the lead into the front of the video. Oh, yes. And our video was shagged. The recording mechanism was shagged. It wouldn't press into record. If you press it into record, it would go and stop and then stop itself. And I was like, oh, God, I've got to miss this again. So what you could do is you could play it. <laughs> and then, you know, once it came on, you could hit the record button while it was playing and it would work. This is the genius. The kids have it easy these days. Phones and... I was going to say that, you know, it made things so much more precious when they weren't available. Now, because you can just, we can click onto that very thing you're talking about and watch it straight away. Isn't it bizarre? Yeah, it's totally bizarre. And I was up to right, uh, and I did, I got the clip you showed, like the outro of Words of Aaron. And I finally oh, right. got it and I was over the moon. It was about a minute and a half. You showed Wishbow and Ash for like three minutes before it. <laughs> And, so have you got uh, any old, any more old records there you can, uh, you can dig out and show us? So anyway, when I look back at the clip, it jumped all the way through it because I had a bad videotape. <laughs> so, <laughs> this is my original stereo. Oh, the zombie. Oh, yes. With the wonderful right. misspelling of the word Odyssey. Yes. It's, it, I'll tell you a little story about this. It was a Dutch guy. It's, this is an original stereo British copy, which obviously is... It's very hard to find now, you know. It's getting towards four figures now for Odyssey and Argyle. Is it really good? Oh, cool. Yeah, the original. Uh, a mono, definitely, but um, stereo, sorry, uh, it's still gettable, but you're talking about eight, nine hundred quid. So this guy had it for 500 quid on Discogs. This is like a few years ago. And of course, I always wanted it. And I knew it's only going to get more and more rare and... And I, I just sent him a message and said, I'll give you 250 quid for it. And he just said, oh, don't be silly, you know, but thank you. And I said, it's okay. And uh, Thomas Walsh around on me thing. And he goes, are you the guy from Duckworth Lewis Method? He said to me. And I went, yes, uh, I'm Duckworth. And he goes, oh my God, it's my favorite records of the last 20 years. If you send me some promos, I'll give it to you for... And I swear to God, I got it for less than 200 quid. Very good. Very good. Totally lucky, you know. This is a, an original Lepenta Into Your Ears by Pete Dello. Oh, Pete Dello from... Oh, Pete Dello, what? Honey Bus? Pete yes. Dello? Now, this is four figures of a record. Wow. God, that really is... This is the... Um, the uh, Can't Let Maggie Go, Can't wasn't it? Let it was Maggie go. Yeah, 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 that's Can't right. Can't Let Maggie Go. Actually, your music has been compared to Honey Bus on, on various in various reviews in the past, I remember. Well, I, I, have a love for, I have a real love for the band. I mean, I, I, I got to know Colin Hare, and I spoke to Pete a few years ago on the phone. And uh, I, did, I did an EP with Colin Hare, which was actually really good. We got to sound like... 68 you know colin but the thing about it is with those artists and i'm sure you've seen this uh they did you know they had incredible drum sounds and mellotrons in 1968 so when when we go god you must do a record that sounds like that they kind of go well we did that 50 years ago you know yeah. do you want to hear my demos with a tin drum machine and a very bad chorus guitar yeah. <laughs> and that's that's what happens that's the yes. sad thing. I mean, it, I don't mean sad in like a putting down way. I mean, th the reason why that's, they're still talking about those records is because they're iconic sounding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And beautiful yeah. records. And so we did get them to do songs of that era. And it was, it was really ex accepted really well. Called Down from Pittswood, the EP was called. And, uh, it, he found a song from the Honey Bus era, which... Uh, I sourced on a on a bootleg BBC bootleg called "Incredibly Bad." It's called. But what a brilliant song! I got a little uh, special box here of singles that I got out for you. Um, oh, go on. Which has some some beauties in it, and some I'd like you to <coughs> have a look at. Now, hold on, sorry, I 
Well, first of all, there's a message from the country acetate. Oh gosh! Wow. Se a seven inch yeah, a seven inch wow. single. Um, that's a a Knight Riders acetate that was given to me by Dave Pritchard, who was originally in Mike Sheridan and the Knight Riders. It's the first. Oh, is it the group before the move, isn't it? Yeah, they they you know pre them. Now this is this is my God, you really very special one. This is, uh, <laughs> this is a, a parade of the most this unbelievable, stuff. valuable <laughs> stuff. And, in, in, it will pr provoke enormous envy about uh, anybody watching. I think so. Let's get back the Beatles. But on what, what is that? A, is that an acetate or what is that? Yeah, that's that's my only. That's probably my prized possession. Uh, what is it again? It's an original uh, Get Back Acetate. Now, there's a story behind it. <laughs> uh, you, I can't imagine what that's worth. That's ridiculous. Well, you know, it's seeing better days, but it's beautifully playable and it sounds fantastic. Now, the thing about it is, it's, it's hugely bass heavy. Now, the story behind this is Marcus Holler, who runs Sugarbush Records, a lovely label, uh, and he releases some of my old vinyl, just a very limited editions, you know. And uh, he's a collector as well. And, and he goes around the house, you know, the usual stuff. And he went around to this woman's house who was the wife of an ex-EMI employee. And she, he went to the attic. She said, oh, he's got a few boxes in the attic because her family said she should sell the stuff. This is what happens. This is the way collectors do their thing. Uh, and he went up to the attic and he, he sent me pictures of the whole day and stuff. And there was a crate of singles and it was all like really pretty much, you know, Shadows and Cliff Richard and The Foremost and Billy J. Cray, all that kind of stuff. So he found a, a Beatles Hits EP, which is not worth a lot, and it was just a picture sleeve. And there was a record inside, and he pulled it out, and it was that. So he nearly shit himself, obviously. Uh, <laughs> which is what you would do. Well, he gave the woman a fairly decent price. Now, the thing was, straight away, a, a collector came in to buy it. Well, he'd mentioned it for about nine seconds online that he found this thing. And I just kind of done a republishing with Sony, and I got a few quid. So I went, to. I'm treating myself. And I, I, got, I sent him a message. I said, Marcus, what, what's the story with that acetate? And he goes, well, uh, it's pretty much sold, Thomas. I have someone. And I went... Well, what are you asking for? And he went, you know, Bleh. and I says, well, what about I undercut that immensely because of your friend? And incredibly, he said, yeah. And he said, oh, what a brilliant and, negotiating tactic. Let me pay you less. <laughs> yeah, and it worked. This is the, the way the artist could use pressure yeah, on yeah, the yeah. label. That's and, fabulous. Uh, but of course, I got a lot of flack online there because people are saying it's, it's counterfeit. Now, I'm a collector for 40 odd years. Uh, I'm 50 years old now. I'm collecting since I was seven, six or seven. So I'm 43 years of collecting. And this is not a counterfeit. You have to hold it in your hand anyway. But then he sent yeah. me a story from a magazine, an industry magazine, that McCartney went into Trident's. It's, it's, it's memorialized in some kind of rare book. Went to Trident to do a remix of Get Back just before it was pressed for single because he thought it was too slow and he thought it was bass light. The him being a bass man, of course. Yeah, yeah, that yeah, does yeah. happen. Yeah, and uh, yeah. so there is documentation of him going into Trident and doing this new mix. And that's what this is it's like really fast, stupidly fast, and it's quite bassy. And uh, so he walked out Trident with what with about five of these, I'd say. Well, it's sitting there beside me now. God, that's fantastic! That's fantastic! That is, I used to amaze. It's, it's not even acetate, but it's actually not the version that came out. It's not, but you know, people still want. People have asked me about getting getting it onto MP3 and stuff. I don't have the ways to do that. Uh, I put a clip of it up on Facebook, and of course, it was the sound was dubbed straight away. Uh, their algorithms, even though I hate that word, uh, they sussed it out straight away. Uh, I put a picture of Roy Wood up with his cock hanging out, 
and on Facebook, and they, they took it down straight away and banned me for a day. <laughs> Which, in fairness, you know. <laughs> so, Thomas, how are you getting on in this current situation? Oh, wow, what's that? Rhubarb. It's a rhubarb and custard album. Now, that means nothing to me. Go on, tell me. Do you not remember rhubarb and custard the cartoon? I don't really. No, don't it's a, really. we're too old. He, this he is a, too old, you see. It's cartoons kids' program, wasn't it? It's it's got like um, Pete Wayneman produced it or something. It's only in '76. You weren't that young, old, young. I was beyond the age of cartoons in 1976. Yeah. Let me tell you. I'll tell you. You remember this? Oh, we can't see that. Go on. What's that? Mary, Mary Mungo and Mitch. Oh, Mitch. Wow. <laughs> I know the names. That's amazing. It's got Richard Baker doing the voice. Oh, very good. Very good. You know good. Richard Baker from Monty Python? Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and several so, Richard Bacons. So, so, Thomas, how are, you, how are you coping with the current situation? You're staying indoors. Yes, I haven't been out in like nine weeks. Um Obviously, that's good for my size. Uh, but it, it, it's very tough, you know, because we, we're quite vigilant over here. You know, it's, it's quite... Uh, we don't get too political and depressing, but it, it, it's a bit sad looking at, looking at England, you know, and America, because, you know, there's a lot of... You know, it's, it's tough because, you know, a lot of people are flaunt, flaunting it or flaunting it, whatever the word is. And over here, we're, we're being quite vigilant. But we're very close here, you know, we're always, we love you, you know, we're very close here, we're neighbours. There's a mm -hmm. lot of love and hate over the years, but it's tough at the moment because we're holding on to our lockdown. Uh, it's mm. our reopening that's very important to us. Mm. So we're waiting to, uh, but you know, I won't have any rush to go out. So have you literally not been out at all in, in nine or ten weeks? Literally, no, I mean, not been out the house, not been out the garden? At the front door some days. Wow, how does that feel? That must be extraordinary. Uh, honestly, Brian Wilson, 1976. <laughs> now, you know, it, it's... It, I can do that because I lived on my own for a long time. You know, I've... Uh, it, it's kind of... I'm kind of used to it in a way. And, you know, being a musician and a musician like in a band like Pugwash or whatever, work is extremely peaks and troughs, you know? So it could be a lot of work, a lot of traveling, and then nothing for three months. And because we did a lot of our work when we were in our mid to late 40s and all addicted to prescription drugs, alcohol, non-prescription drugs, and women, uh, we all nearly died in our mid 40s. So coming back from tours, we would tend to sit around for six weeks and do nothing uh, yeah. to recover. Uh, I really don't recommend doing a coast-to-coast a -coast American tour in a van at 46. <laughs> no, I bet. I bet. So are, are you writing songs? Uh, to be honest with you, I'm not really, but I've, I've, joined, I've joined the wonderful world of Disney recently. Uh, I'm writing some stuff for Disney in America. Oh, really? Some, yeah, I've got some fans there, and I've, there's a couple of songs that are on a an up and coming kind of a big cartoon that's coming out next year, Disney Plus. Oh, called... very good. Whoa, that's good work. Fantastic. Yeah, it's, it's called The Course really of Molly McGee. Uh, there's some stuff online already. It's, we, I've seen some rushes in February when I went to visit. I've been to Disney a few times now. It's, it's, it's an amazing experience being inside. So you're hoping for a kind of Randy Newman style kind of uh, bonus. That'd be nice, wouldn't it? Well, Randy, definitely. Oh, uh, I don't think a new man is the way I'm going to be after this. Randy, <laughs> old man. That's what I'll be. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, Thomas, thank you very much indeed for your time. I didn't even uh, scratch the surface. Look, I'll do some lucky dips. Uh, go on, quickly. Go on. <laughs> An acetate of days by the kinks. Oh, God. oh nice. <laughs> My uh, God, I cannot imagine the value of these things. Well, I'll tell you, Eye watering. 
I'm hoping I'm, Danny Baker never watches this. Ruin his well, day. Well, I'll just tell you, right? These I got. I have three original Bonzo Dog Do That Band acetates from '66 <laughs> that I got off this lady in England years ago. And I, when I was in LA in February, I got them digitally transferred for the box set that's coming up. And I've, I was privy to hearing some stuff off that box set, and it's going to be incredible. Andrew Sandoval is is curating it. You know, the American guy who walks uh, in the bunker. I assume you never play these things because it would devalue them, wouldn't it? Oh, I play them. You know, acetates have more than nine or ten players in them. But I don't go mad with the acetates now. But you know, but you know, oh, zombies care of cell forty four a label. <laughs> I'm just doing lucky dips, Mark and David. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh yes, I wanted to show you this quickly. It's the it's the misspelled Sid Barrett octopus demo. Oh, oh, God. Where he's it's B A R A T T. Fantastic. That's quite you, I'm going to ask you something now, Thomas. Have you got a copy of the American, an American copy of the second ELO album? I think I'm right in saying it's the second ELO album. So ELO 2, I know that's very... Uh, uh, but, but isn't the American one, isn't there one called No Title? The, the first one was called No Answer because when they... Oh, is that what it was called? <laughs> Tell the story. Tell well, the story. They, they rang, the Americans rang to get the name of the title for the album, supposedly. Uh, oh, United, yeah. United Artists in America. And they got, the girl, the secretary, got no answer on the call. So she wrote no answer on a pad. And it was called no answer. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> That's a fantastic That's story. That's very good. I, I, and the thing is, just to end it, uh, you have been such an important part of my collecting life because... You know, I followed just through all them years and he's always mentioned bands that I'd go, who the hell are they? You know, you might mention it as a joke when you're talking to each other in the studio. Because you always remember David would say something to Mark and go, yeah, but wasn't he the bass player with yeah. Liddy Blacknap? And I go, who are they? And next of all, I'd go out next day and I'd, I'd suss out a record with them and I'd like it and I'd, I'd buy it. We can only apologise <laughs> <laughs> for, for wasting so much of your life. <laughs> well, I apologise for the Aussie Bisa albums or whatever they're called. How do you pronounce <laughs> Thomas, it's been, it's been lovely to talk to you. I'm Fantastic. sorry you didn't talk that much. I can only apologise. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much, Nice Thomas. to see you. Terrific. I love you all. Stay well. Stay Thank well. You. He's not great.